You're listening to Crud Talk, a ministry of 50 shades of grace. Everybody's got a story. I'm guessing like me, you've been hurt before. But what if I told you there was more to this life than being stuck in the hurt and sin of your past? Hey, we all have crud, but it's how we deal with it that makes all the difference. Today's episode is brought to you by the generous sponsors of the Key to Freedom Conference. We thank you for your generous gift, which allows us to share hope and continue to help people deal with the crud in their lives. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Crud Talk. I'm Sonia Bruner. How are you doing? Y'all, today is the day after the Key to Freedom Conference. It was fantastic. My prayer from the beginning was that people would know that they are loved. The women that would come to this conference would know that they are deeply loved and that I would be able to hand them the key to freedom, which I believe the the key to freedom is Jesus Christ. Y'all, what happened at this event I could go, I I think I probably could do three episodes, four episodes on all the things that God did. Because I'm telling you, I didn't do one stinking bit of it. It had zero to do with me. All he asked was for me to do the ask. And I did. Six weeks ago, yesterday, this conference wasn't even in existence. And Jesus said, I want you to ask. And we did. And within three minutes, we three seconds, we had the yes. And it just snowballed from there. And I I am just going to tell you, if you are needing something, you've been waiting for something and you're needing something, ask. Do the ask. Jesus says in his word to ask. It's really important. It's a big deal. And so I did it. And literally within 48 hours, the conference theme, the video, what I was supposed to talk about, what it was called, all of it came into existence because Jesus was in it. He did it. He made it all happen. And so just a word of encouragement to you. If you are out there trying to do something, you have a ministry, you have a business, you, you, you have a vision that the Lord has given you, don't give up. My goal is to help people deal with their crud. My goal is to point people to Jesus. And I want them to know that they're loved and I want them to be free, free from their crud and free from their sin. And that's my ministry, 50 Shades of Grace. That's my ministry. And so that's why I do life coaching. That's why all the things that I do, I go out and speak, I lead worship, I do all kinds of stuff, right? The reason I do my why is to share my story and to point people to Jesus Christ because honestly, y'all, he is the hope. He's the one that can change our heart. He's the one that can heal and restore that which is broken. And so anyway, I'm passionate. Y'all know that because if you listen to my my show, you you know that. But this conference was not in existence (laughs) six weeks ago. You have to understand that. And within, like I said, 48 hours, everything happened. Um, Most of the time... You are not the event planner, the event speaker, (laughs) and the event worship leader. This was a unique situation. And I I just have to say, I'm gonna I'm gonna beg for forgiveness later, but my partner in crime, the one that stepped in in such a huge way, is a lady by the name of Lonnie Sadler. And Lonnie has a heart for Jesus and she's passionate about sharing Jesus with other people. And so she didn't, I didn't ask her, she volunteered and she did all the food and, and so, so, so much more, all the things. Every, every day, every week, something new and cool was happening. And she would, I mean, we just, I could go on and on. Okay. And so I just want you to know that this event was prayed for. I told so many people over and over, I was just thankful that I got to be in the room and watch Jesus do his thing. It was so amazing. Let me just tell you a couple highlights too, because I have so much to share tonight. But for me, a big one was leading worship. I just love worship, right? And worship just isn't music. 
y'all, so some of you that are listening might not know who Jesus is, and that's totally okay. Worship is what you do with your whole life. It's it's out of a heart that says he Jesus has changed my life. And so Jesus is the one that gets all the praise, all the worship. Okay? We that that's that's why we call it that. And so it's not just in in a church building in a room singing songs. It's your whole life is an act of worship to Jesus. And so I love it. But I really love it in a room full of people and especially ladies. I'm going to tell y'all the singing was off the chart. They were so loud. I finally just took the mic away from my mouth and just let them sing to me. They were like literally they were just singing praises to God. It, it was like I just wanted to be in the room with them. You know what I mean? And so that was probably one of the, the biggest highlights for me is just the worship that happened from their whole heart, right? Women got saved and that's why I do what I do. Um, they, there is no key to freedom without Jesus. Women actually met Jesus. I had shared, I'm planning for 50 people. We had way more than that. We probably had close to three times that that showed up. Just again, nothing we did. It was all Jesus drawing people. I was so grateful to get to be in the room. That's that's it. And to be able to share my story and um yeah, it it was just overwhelming and so powerful. And so some of the things um that I talked about was obviously prisons and cages and chains, right? Actual prisons and metaphorical prisons. And and I, I offered this up saying, some people might say, well, what's the difference? How are we gonna know what you're talking about? And my heart is this, as I studied these last five and a half weeks, six weeks, does it matter? It stinks to be in any prison when all you wanna do is be free. And then I shared one when I was five, my mom had a relationship with a man and she'd leave me with him when she'd go to work. Y'all know that, I've shared my story before. He was really kind, but then his abuse started. And as it went on and on, I literally was stripped of all human emotion. I learned a couple of things. When somebody says they love you, it's not true. I learned that words don't matter and they also hurt. And he'd always kind of use... um, fear by threatening to hurt me or my mom right and so one day he made good on that and he beat her I mean ferociously beat her and I don't know um watching that as a child watching her take that beating because I said no I told the ladies that something in me stopped and from that day on I did whatever that man said and that truly is the moment that my prison sentence began and I kept asking, this is the, this is, it's so weird about this whole process. I kept, I kept wondering, oh, Lord, how does my story have anything to do with keys? And then it hit me, oh my goodness, it totally does. The man who hurt me, he held the key to my freedom. I was in the prison that he created and therefore he had the key. He didn't just have one key, he had a bunch of keys, right? Threats that he made, like violence and lies and manipulation and abuse. Those were some of the keys, if you will, that he had on his keychain. And he'd hold those keys just out of reach, right? He'd give me ultimatums like, be a good girl and do what I say, and then I'll let you out. And I was a little child and I would be hopeful, right? And my, oh my goodness, I believed that if I was a good girl and I did what he said, these horrible, evil sexual acts that he did to me, I believed it because I was a child, right? He would never hurt me again and I'd be free. But then he'd dangle the keys in my face and as I'd try to jump and grab them, he'd yank them away. And then I'd be hurt even worse and I stayed locked in the prison. Was he dangling actual metal keys away? No. But what he did is the same thing. It's metaphorical. And I just, I was like, Lord, you are absolutely brilliant. I, I've never thought about my story in, in relationship to having a key that let me out of the prison I was in. And so this whole concept, the key to freedom came about. And then I shared about the day that I was sold to men for the first time. And that's the day I became property and my trafficking started. Not only was I in prison, but now I was put in chains, like literal chains. And I asked the ladies, you're probably wondering what the difference is when you're in a prison cell. Sure, you don't have a lot of space, but you do 
have a certain amount of choice and control over your movement. But when you're chained, you're restricted by the length and the weight of the chain. A short chain, you have zero movement. If you have a long chain, you might be a little better off. But if it's heavy, it doesn't matter either way because you're not able to carry the weight. So then when you're chained, you're not going anywhere. You're stuck right where you are and that weight crushes you. And why that's a big deal is because I think the prison for us, for you and I, is when we're trying to be the, the boss of our own lives and we're trying to keep the control in difficult situations and circumstances that make us feel out of control and trapped because we hate that. At least in our prisons, we still have some kind of choice. But when you have a heavy chain, it stops you in your tracks. And that's what completely alters everything, like, like, a, like a serious diagnosis, like the loss of a loved one, something, something life-changing, right? It's that heavy chain, and it just crushes you, and you feel helpless. Those men that, they had the keys to my prison too, those men that hurt me. I mean, he sold me for several years to men. That's part of my story. But they had the keys to my prison. They had the opportunity that, to help me, but they didn't. And get this in your mind. Even when they'd open the door, right? You think, okay, I'm locked in this room. But I'm, when they open the door and I could actually walk through a door, it never was good for me. I wasn't free. I desperately needed someone with a key to let me out. Not every open door leads to something better. Because having the right key to the right door matters. My mom asked me, is this guy hurting you? And I said, yes. And I thought, this is it. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm finally going to be free from this torture. My mother was going to give me the key to my freedom. And oh my goodness, I was going to get the help that I had been waiting for and I'd be free. But she changed. Something happened. She blamed me for seducing him. She said that I was a dirty girl and that I had tricked him and forced him to do these things to me. See, my mom had a key that let me out of the room I was locked in, but I still wasn't free. She'd let me out and she'd beat me. That that key to that door was not good because having the right key matters. She'd keep me locked up in my room a lot. I, I miss school. It was awful. She would withhold food and I shared this at the conference and I don't share it a lot, but it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a big deal for me in my life. It's part of my story. She would withhold food so I'd have to sneak out to get the food whenever I could. And I was always afraid. I mean, always. And I shared this quote that I found. Fear is a powerful weapon. People who grow up in a hurtful environment or had to live in constant survival mode learn life differently. They learn to not get their hopes up. They learn to look out for themselves because that's the only person they can trust. They learn to push people away or hold them too tight. Either way, letting others in could be the most lethal mistake and they know they might never recover should they allow themselves to hope. They learn to please others, even at the detriment of their own feelings and values with the hopes of gaining a longer lasting connection, good or bad. They learn that words don't mean anything, actions do. They learn to criticize themselves and they learn to not show weakness. We all have reasons why we do what we do. And depending on what has happened to us, our life experiences, we have crud. And I, <laughs> it was so funny when I brought up the word crud because I, I'm known as the crud dealer. I help people deal with their crud. So it's like, people are always like, what the heck is crud, Sonia? It goes like this, people hurt us, right? And that leftover pain is our crud. We all have it. The key is whether or not we've dealt with it because how we deal with it makes all the difference. Where you and I get ourselves in trouble is when we refuse to deal with our hurt and we actually start to respond to others or ourselves in unhealthy ways. And we see it all the time. And now your crud has become your sin. And this is the saddest part. Your sin has become someone else's crud. Oh, and there's the circle. There's the vicious cycle of sin and crud. Crud that isn't dealt with, then becomes sin in your life. Then you act out and act inappropriate or wrong towards someone else that's unhealthy. And then now your sin, because you didn't deal with your crud, has become someone else's crud. Oh, 
the Lord showed me that through this process. So that that's just been kind of mind blowing for me. And we also talked about um, that we're more isolated, empty and angry and depressed and dissatisfied and discouraged and exhausted. Women more than ever are checked out emotionally and they live in denial most days. And I'm just gonna say it, even people that claim to be Christians, and I don't mean that as an you claim it, I, I'm just saying people that say that they're Christians, they're even walking around like they're totally hopeless. And guess what I found out? That's exactly what someone in a prison feels like. There's all kinds of prisons, right? Physical prisons and emotional prisons. Mm. Being in a prison is a state of being held or captive, not being able to leave, imprisoned or enslaved or confined, not being free. And here's, here's, what I, here's what I learned. People who are in prison or have been held in captivity experience isolation, emptiness, anger, depression, numbness, discouragement, exhaustion, fear, loneliness, anxiety, guilt, denial, and a sense of hopelessness and without meaning or purpose. It's exactly the same thing. We're walking around in a prison. We are, we are, we are in prison because we're, we're not dealing with our crud. It was just like, boom, you know, <laughs> my mind was just blown. And even in prepping for the conference, I found this, this article about, about the prison system. This, this one, you guys, is going to blow you away. I, the conf, when, we, when I talked about this at the conference, the ladies were like, what? Their faces were just like, oh, and they were scribbling their notes. It was awesome. Okay, so listen to this. I got this from an article about prisons. Those who have been in a prison for extended periods of time may also lead to a condition called learned helplessness in which individuals come to believe that no matter what they do to improve their circumstances, it doesn't help and nothing will change and they feel helpless. And so I'm a word person, you know, I've talked about this many times, I'm a word nerd. So I look up helpless. Helpless means uh, to ha you have no ability to take care of or protect yourself. Like a newborn baby is helpless and needs parents to care for it, right? So if you're helpless and you're depend you are dependent on another person to assist or care for you, and helpless is also described, this was really interesting, as uncontrollable, like they burst into a helpless laughter. And I just got the giggles over that. We all know how as humans, not being able to control the situation or the outcome is not going to go over well. Most of us feel like we need some type of control. And when that doesn't happen, we freak out. I thought this was such an interesting concept because I was talking about how women are walking around with so much discouragement and hurt. If helplessness can be learned and you believe that no matter what you do, it will never help or change, no wonder there's such a defeated hopelessness in the world. That word learned, that got my attention. I thought that was really revealing. If something can be learned, the Lord told me this so clear. It can be unlearned. Oh, so good. I believe that we all have crud. Some of us have dealt with our crud and some of us have not. <laughs> I've been helping people deal with their crud for over 20 years and this is what I see. Number one, we don't know we have crud or what our specific crud is. Number two, we don't know how to deal with the crud in a healthy way. And number three, we're in denial and or lying to ourselves and everybody else about it. And we're trying to do life our way, you know, because we have to be in control and we're stuck in, in what I call the crud jail. <laughs> I want to get t-shirts so bad, y'all, that say crud jail. Satan doesn't want us to deal with our crud. He wants us to stay locked in the prison of that hurt. When I work with people who are struggling with hurt from the past, these are the three areas that people get stuck in a crud jail. These are the big ones, y'all. Number one, they, the blame game. We all have tons of excuses about why we do what we do. Look where I come from. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what they did to me, Sonia. <laughs> and it's true, I don't. When we've been hurt or disappointed, it's easy to blame others, even God. But I've learned that when I sin, I've made a choice to do it. Our circumstances don't make us sin. When we can't control what others do, but we can control how we respond. If there's crud in your life that you haven't dealt with, you're not free because crud is a prison. 
We need to quit blaming our mothers and our fathers and our siblings and our spouses and our teachers, maybe our employers, even the church. Here's the key. We need to admit it. And we need to admit our part of it. We need to confess it. And we need to deal until we heal for however long that takes until we're not doing something that's unhealthy to ourselves or someone else. And then we can get on with living, right? Got to do the work to do that. Number two, guilt. Satan wants to paralyze us with guilt. Guilt for the things we've done and guilt for the things we should have done but didn't do. Crud jail. (laughs) The problem with carrying around the guilt is that it holds you back and prevents you from moving forward. And I talk about this, you guys, so many times when I'm when I'm speaking, I've been doing this for so long. And it's like being on a gerbil wheel. The little rat, he gets on the wheel and he runs and he runs and runs and runs and runs and runs, runs, but he never gets anywhere. As we carry around that guilt, all we see is I'm so unworthy, I've blown it again, I'm worthless, I little, 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 I'm just me, 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 me. Instead of our focus being on Jesus who can fix it, the focus becomes us. And Satan loves that. And I just have to ask, are you on the gerbil wheel? I believe some of you are carrying around all the guilt and you're so trapped under the weight of your guilt that you can't even breathe. But God is faithful to forgive. And the key is to admit it, confess it, and get rid of it. And then the third one is the inability to forgive. (laughs) Y'all, this one is a hard one. This one can mess you up. Oh, we know we're supposed to forgive, but it's so much easier to hold on to the anger because then we're one up on that person who hurt us. We hold this thing over their heads so that we're always a little higher than they are as a way to keep some kind of leverage over that person. That leverage makes us feel validated. It says, my hurt happened. It's real. And then there's this, the hurt and the anger keeps us from allowing others to get close enough to ever hurt us again. That anger, that inability to forgive is the fuel. We use that unforgiveness to remind us to never allow someone to hurt us like that again. When we refuse to forgive, we become bitter, poisoned, and stuck. We stay stuck in that crud jail. (laughs) I know what it feels like to be hurt and betrayed by people that should have known better but didn't do better by me. I get it. Y'all, that's my story. I've learned that forgiveness means that you look at what they did to you. You really look at it. And then you release them from the debt that you think they owe you. So hard. Holding on to that hurt and pain keeps the debt alive and due in full. When we refuse to forgive, someone always owes us something. And that gives us great satisfaction and power. I know how hard it is to forgive. Oh, took me a long time. Did those people that hurt me owe me something, do you think? Did they? I think they did. Just like I owe a debt to every single person I've ever hurt. We can't ask for forgiveness from others when we are refusing to forgive someone else. As if their sin against us is any worse than the one that we've done to someone else. And this includes ourselves. There's so many of you that will not forgive yourself for sin in your past. Because you don't want to let yourself off the hook. By making yourself continue to owe that debt and pay, you're like a dog on a chain. You're never rid of it. You can move, but it's always there. It's yanking you back so you can never move on. Then you blame yourself for it, which allows that guilt to become your reason for self-sabotage. You're never worthy of anything more, and you stay chained to the debt. And staying chained actually gives you the excuse you need Because then you never have to emotionally engage past the chain. Mm. The act of refusing to forgive yourself is a way you get to keep control over your emotions and potential hurts in the future. And this is what we forget. We can't refuse to forgive ourselves. And we can't refuse to forgive others. It's like we're saying that we know more than God. You might not see it this way, but in all of these... You are choosing the prison. If you refuse to deal with your crud, you are choosing the prison. You got to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it, you're going to continue to respond out of that hurt and pain. And you're going to make choices based on the pain instead of freedom and truth. You're going to try to fill those places with things instead of allowing Jesus to clean it out. In other words, we keep acquiring new keys 
so we can walk through what we think will be the door to happiness and fulfillment. And then everything will be okay. If you're stuck, if you're struggling, you're in jail. You're in crud jail. Here's what I've learned about doing this, y'all. We do what we want to do, and that we don't, we don't. In every single decision we make, every single choice, there's always something in it for us. If you're struggling with forgiveness or letting it go or moving forward, let me just stop right here and make you really mad. The reason you can't get past it is because you probably don't want to. Ask yourself this, what am I getting out of it by not forgiving myself or someone else? Remember, we do what we want to do and that we don't, we don't. Having the right key matters. So we have keys, right? Lots and lots of keys. We're carrying these big old heavy keychains and we open door after door, but we're still not getting what we need. We're walking around discouraged, y'all, exhausted and hopeless. We have crud, but we haven't dealt with our crud. So we're in crud jail. We hate where we are, but we're afraid of what's ahead. And because of constantly being in that prison, we feel alone and we don't believe anybody cares. And this is the key. What I've learned in helping people is they don't believe they're loved. They don't believe they're loved. And this is why the Key to Freedom Conference even came into being. I was like, Lord, so many people are hurting. Everyone I work with, they all have crud that they haven't dealt with and it's causing major issues in their lives. They aren't free. They have keys to just about everything, every situation, every emotion. Do this and you'll be happy. Do that and you'll be happy. There's lots of doors and lots of different kinds of prisons. We might have a key, but having the right key matters. And here's what's so sad. So many people have stopped living. They've given up. Those of you listening right now, and this is resonating with you, life hasn't turned out the way you thought it would, and that hurts. But instead of dealing with that, you've been stuck. And what's worse is some of you have chosen to be stuck. Listen to this from God's word, Galatians 5, verse 7 and 8. You were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. Who's held you back? It certainly isn't God. If you find yourself disappointed, maybe you're hurt, maybe you're lifeless. You have a choice to change your situation. Your heart, your attitude, your brokenness can be radically healed and transformed by God and his word and by dealing with your crud. (laughs) But you're going to have to do the hard work. Nobody's going to do the work for you. You got to make the choice to do it for you. You got to do it for you. Stay stuck in the prison or open the door, but you're going to need a key. The key we need right now is the truth because you can't do anything until you get real about the crud in your life. Everybody's got crud, but you got to know what your crud is, which means you've got to tell the truth. The key to dealing with your crud is having the guts to tell the truth because you can't be free without the truth. In Isaiah 42, verse seven, it says, you will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. Oh my goodness, this is like, I have so much to say. We're gonna talk about this again next week for part two, the key to freedom. Thank you to everyone who sponsored our event, who gave door prizes, who helped in any way. And thank thank you, great big thank you to Miss Lonnie Sadler. Thank you to all the women who showed up, who had the guts to try to deal with their crud, who were honest with God, and who did business and worshiped with their whole heart. There were many tears and many, many smiles. People were doing business. I was just thankful to get to be in the room. Having the right key matters. And that key is Jesus Christ. Everybody's got crud. It's how we deal with it that makes all the difference. I'm Sonia Bruner. This is Crud Talk. See you next time.